Hello the world, hello Jason Isaacs, hello Politicats, uh, hello people who are interested in American foreign policy, because that's what we're here to talk about today. Now this is a reworking of a much older presentation because much has happened since I did it, and uh, much of that is going to be of tremendous use to you uh, as you go into the exams. Now this is a huge topic, and like all huge topics, uh, I strongly advise that you divide and rule. And we are going to divide it first into fighting and talking. And then within that, we're going to look at powers and checks. And then within each of those, we're going to look at de facto uh, and de jure. Now, get used to chucking those terms around. They're going to make your life so much easier because, you know, they're very good and they impress examiners and they're quite precise and easy to use. So de facto, de jure, powers and checks, military and uh, diplomacy or fighting and talking. This is how we're going to go forward. Chances are I'm going to string across two different presentations here because there's so much to talk about and I always find myself digressing massively. So we'll probably look at uh, the military first and then move on and uh, look at diplomacy. So without further ado, um, fighting. Um, <laughs> that little quote there, I force my students to watch this uh, pretty much every time. And um, yeah, I hope they like it. Um, I absolutely love it. I much prefer the newsroom to um, to the uh, West Wing, uh, but then that's just me. Both of them obviously looking a little dated now, but hey, oh, there you go. So fighting, de jure, what does the constitution actually have to tell us uh, about fighting? And the answer is not very much, but at least it's very, very specific. The president is commander in chief. He can deploy the military at will. Now, the Constitution obviously was written uh, in 1789 when, or 1788 when war was conducted one way. And uh, we nowadays conduct war in very, very different ways. Uh, we also, of course, have nuclear war. Now, I'm not going to talk about nuclear war massively in this presentation because it all comes under the same barrel or all comes under the same category of military force. The president is the commander of the military. The military commands nuclear forces, and so terrifying as it may be, Trump is in sole command of the nuclear arsenal of the United States. Um, if you want to be really depressed, I strongly advise uh, having a look at a, um, an amazing radio lab um, uh, podcast that goes into great detail about who can press the uh, nuclear button and what you should do if uh, you are actually responsible for launching the missiles and you don't think it's a particularly good idea. Uh, I will link off to that uh, at the end. I've dig digressed already. So the president is the commander in chief uh, of the armed forces, while on the other hand, Congress declares war. That's what it does. Congress, uh, both as the Congress have to, has to declare war. But sadly, this is now effectively moot, uh, largely because Congress hasn't declared war. or Indeed, the United States hasn't declared war in anything other than abstract nouns since 1970. Sorry, since 1942. Uh, 1942, we had war declared on a few Balkan states. Uh, since then, war has been declared on, in no particular order, poverty, uh, drugs and um, uh, terrorism, uh, but no national state. Instead, we've had this ongoing, uh, the ongoing use of military action. And <clears throat> partially in response to that, the War Powers Act, oh, I've done it again, sorry, the War Powers Resolution was passed in 1973. And this was in response to the Iraq War, Iraq War, Vietnam War, sorry. And this gave the president a 90 day operating window, 60 in and 30 out. If he did have to go beyond that, then Congress had to declare war or otherwise create some sort of ongoing sanction. And that's what we've been seeing uh, ever since then. We've seen Congress again rolling the dice and uh, extending uh, its approval of military action. So what does it mean if we're talking about Congress approving military action? Well, th this is the thing. The president is the highest officer, the highest ranking officer. So in terms of de facto checks on him, there's not very much he can do. However, Congress has control of the treasure. Now, fighting any war involves cost. And uh, what we've seen recently is that the uh, the team with the biggest treasure pile will generally win the war because they uh, have the <laughs> they have greater resources uh, at their disposal. Congress is in control of the power of the purse. Congress raises the money and spends the money. So anything that the president does in terms of military has to be at some level funded by Congress. Now, Congress obviously delivers a huge amount of money to the president every year and a huge amount of military spending uh, goes on every single year. 
Um, and so at any given time, the president has a huge amount of resources at his disposal. However, as war is the process, as war is effectively the, the, the process of taking those resources and destroying them in your enemy's face, sooner or later, you're going to need more. And if you need more and Congress hasn't uh, actually signed off on giving you any more, then you may find yourself in a bit of trouble. I'll try to remember that. We'll come back to it later. The other uh, tr the other cost, the other de facto um, cost that the president has, or the other de facto check that exists on the president, excuse me, is that of blood. You know, there will always be a cost to any military action. There will be bodies uh, on the ground uh, very, very soon after the boots, normally. And that cost has to be borne by somebody. Whether it's the enemy or your own troops, you will have to account, the president will have to account for those deaths. Now, if those deaths are contained, particularly if those deaths are contained within the uh, within the enemy, then maybe that's not so much of a problem. However, if you're looking at a significant cost, uh, particularly in terms of your own blood, then if you're the president, that's an awful lot to carry by yourself. And so when the president is considering military action, he needs to be absolutely certain that he has these particular costs here under control or otherwise shared with Congress. So we'll explain exactly what that means, uh, perhaps through the use of some examples. Right. So let's start off. The uh, The last time the US declared war was not actually in 1941. It was in 1942. It was in January 1942 against Romania and Bulgaria, if I remember correctly. Uh, but I'm sure somebody will be kind enough to correct me in the uh, comments section. Um, after that, <coughs> we've got Vietnam. 55 to 73, again, an undeclared uh, war that led to the War Powers Resolution in 73. So Congress never actually declared war on Vietnam. The Iran-Contra affair, I have a different video uh, that we can link off to uh, on that. Um, and um, I find it fascinating. Uh, I'm not going to go into that in a huge amount of detail right now. Um, but do have a look at that video and let me know if you've got any questions. <coughs> Excuse me. Kosovo. Um, this was that idea of remote control war, war by executive order. This was a high level bombing campaign against uh, Serbian positions in Kosovo. Um, Clinton participated in NATO bombing, but without congressional approval. So how could he do that? Well, largely because he knew that the cost in terms of blood was going to be low because the Kosovans didn't, sorry, the Serbian positions were not really in a position, were not really capable of taking down American planes. And also because this was going to be a contained short term affair, they flew in, they dropped their bombs, maybe two or three sorties, and then back again. Now it did run over a period of months. But in terms of the uh, in terms of the resources that the president has, has at his disposal, Clinton did not have to go back to Cl to Congress and say, can I have some money to do some more bombing? So he was able to do that in 1999 because he knew that the cost was contained the cost in the cost of the financial cost was contained the cost in terms of treasure the cost in terms of blood was always going to be minimal at least on the american side and it would be in and out within the 90 day operating prescribed 90 day operating window prescribed by the war powers resolution so he didn't urgently need congressional approval at that point when we look at iraq and afghanistan here we have two long term high cost, uh, both in terms of treasure and in terms of blood, long term, high cost um, military actions. And there was no way that the uh, that the Bush administration could have gone in there in 90 days and um, done what it was that they wanted to do, not least because the AUMF from 2001 is still being used even today to uh, justify uh, incursions uh, into bits of Africa and indeed in Syria. Uh, in pursuit of America's enemies. So Afghanistan and Iraq, very, very different from Kosovo. You're looking at a long term, high cost blood and treasure action that the president could not do without congressional sanction. Um, Libya in 2011 was a different situation entirely. Now, this was not covered by the AUMF because what uh, what uh, Obama was uh, seeking to do here was humanitarian intervention uh, to to, uh, to, to aid those who were rebelling uh, against President Gaddafi. Um, again, this was uh, essentially a bombing campaign. Um, so short, short term, uh, low cost, both in terms of blood and treasure. Um, and 
you know, partially because of that, while the initial bombing was successful in the long term, in terms of establishing a long term stable Libya, uh, it wasn't massively successful. So yes, it, dis it got rid of Gaddafi, but um, it didn't succeed in ushering a stable uh, Libyan um, state. <clears throat> now, Syria is where it gets really complicated. Uh, in 2013, uh, uh, Obama wanted to undertake airstrikes against uh, the positions of Assad. This was in response to his use of chemical weapons. Congress refused to sanction it, um, largely because, or to an extent, because Parliament in, in the UK had refused to sanction um, engagement by uh, Cameron in Syria. But Obama could not be confident that the uh, that the bombing raids would not extend into long term boots on the ground uh, engagement in Syria against Assad, uh, thereby escalating the cost in terms of blood and treasure. <clears throat> and so when Congress said no, he was reluctant to proceed uh, by himself. Um, so what we have there is Congress saying, no, we're not going to do this. We're not going to sanction this. And Obama backing down because he didn't have that support, support that he thought he might later need when the costs in terms of blood and treasure started to escalate. However, in 2014, we had airstrikes not against uh, Assad, but rather against IS and ISIL. There was strong bipartisan support for these in Congress. Uh, and to a certain extent, they were also covered by uh, this one here, the AUMF. Uh, but uh, having signed off, uh, but, but having secured their agreement, uh, Obama went in and started bombing. And we continue bombing uh, to this day. Again, not bombing uh, Assad positions, uh, well, not all the time anyway, uh, but certainly bombing um, IS or uh, ISIL um, positions. So any military action comes at a cost. That cost can be measured in terms of blood, treasure and time. Um, if the president uh, is going to go in, the constitution isn't really going to help him because no one declares war anymore. However, there are these three costs to consider. Can he carry the costs without congressional support? If the answer is yes, then he's prepared to take unilateral military action as, uh, as happened in Libya in 2011 and indeed as happened in Kosovo in 1999. If that's not the case, then only authorized action is going to undertake. And so we have Congress authorizing action in Afghanistan and in Iraq, uh, but not in Syria. And so we have two very, very different scenarios there. Now then, very, very quick points against uh, in terms of what uh, Obama, uh, in, in, case of, in, in terms of what Trump's been up to. So in 2017 and 2018, we had bombings against Assad. Now, these were high range uh, cruise missile attacks, low cost, <laughs> relatively, in terms of blood and treasure. And of course, no military engagement. So no one was worried massively about time. Uh, Congress approved in 2018. Congress wasn't even consulted, blah, blah, blah. The ISIS campaign is covered by the AUMF. And we've seen action in Syria against ISIS, boots on the ground against ISIS and support for the opposition, uh, all of which was effectively covered by the AUMF. And the AUMF uh, has also um, authorization for the use of military force. Yeah, has also seen the extension of troops into uh, Africa and uh, the Middle East and elsewhere. Uh, we've seen extended uh, troops on exercise in Poland and Germany and again in South Korea. Now, the one thing I really did want, to, uh, nothing really happening in Ukraine. Um, this is where it gets really interesting. We, we always talk about troops going in. We rarely find ourselves talking about troops coming out. And then in 2018, Trump surprised everybody by saying, right, OK, that's it. We're withdrawing all of the Syrian troops from um, all, all of our troops, sorry, from Syria because we've defeated ISIS. Like, what? Said everyone, you haven't defeated ISIS. Uh, and even as Secretary of State uh, for Defense resigned uh, in protest. Um, however, nothing really happened. Um, there were some more in, there were some more intacts and um, and um, in the <clears throat> in the face of this rather intensified violence, um, Trump quietly kind of forgot about this uh, until, of course, uh, last month or a couple of months ago when Trump again orders withdrawal of troops from Syria. So this now actually seems to be happening. Uh, we've got more international outrage, but nevertheless, he's going ahead with it, except uh, and of course, Turkey has now surged in to occupy the uh, ground vacated by troops. But then <laughs> earlier this month, Trump has said that uh, he's going to leave troops behind to protect in Syrian oil fields, which isn't really covered by the AUMF. So this is very, very interesting. Trump could be exposing himself to action uh, by Congress should they choose to do so. Um, but we all know about Congress deciding whether or not it's going to act. So here we're looking at unilateral action by Trump 
withdrawing troops without the support of his military. And I'm about to run out of time. Send me your questions. I really look forward to hearing them. And uh, all the very best. Catch me in the comments. <laughs>